Amen. Redeemed. Covered by the blood that was shed for us so that we might have life and so that we might have life more abundantly. He said that, you know, we can, we can put away and wipe away those stains because we've been covered by the blood of Jesus. And we can do that because the Bible tells us that if we come to Him and confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So, we have an open door. We have a Father with open hands and open arms ready to receive us no matter our mess-ups, no matter our worst of screw-ups, no matter what it is that we've faced. And I, I can't think of a better song to go along with where we're headed this morning than I'm Redeemed because it's talking about you know, what we once were, the old man that we once were, and what God has so righteously and so favorably and so mercifully done in our hearts and in our lives. And to me, that's an awesome thing. And so join with me in prayer as we open up the service, as we open up Scripture and read it, that God would speak to our hearts afresh and anew this morning because we need to hear from Him. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask You to have Your will and way in our lives. We submit to you, we surrender to you our all. Lord, it has been a blessing to worship you this morning in song and to lift up our voices in praise to you because you're worthy. Lord, we thank you for redeeming us. Lord, there may be those here that have not been redeemed. Lord, they have not ever received and accepted that blood that was shed for them on the cross that was freely given to them so that they could have life, so that they could have everlasting life with you, so that they could know without a shadow of a doubt that they were going to heaven. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, I pray for those that are hurting, those that have come in that, Father, feel distracted by so much of their past, by so much of the world and things that are going on surrounding them. Lord, difficulties change, Lord. And I pray that, Father, they would meet up with the chain breaker today. God, that they would come to you and lay those burdens before your feet and allow you to take those burdens off of their shoulders, the weight that they've been carrying for far too long. And Lord, that you would show them what it is to be redeemed, that God, they don't have to carry that weight around. They don't have to live in, Lord, shame. They don't have to live as though they're uh, Lord, depressed and defeated all of the time, but they can live in victory because we are more than conquerors through you. So God, speak to our hearts in a mighty way through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been going through a series called Cornerstone. and We uh, have basically been breaking apart this this passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2. And if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there, but... Just to kind of catch you up to date on, on what was, what, what's been going on, we, we shared a little bit about how we are to uh, experience and, and desire the, the sincere milk, the spiritual milk that comes from the Word of God, that we should be desiring and always desiring our relationship and to further our relationship with God. And then how it talks about we're... We're living stones, and, and Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And it uses that analogy of building. And some of us in here have, have worked construction, and we know a lot about what that means, and, and we can, we can kind of you know, fit that together. It's not as, as prevalent in our world because not everybody knows how to build something. Um, we, you know, we pay other people to do that. But in that day... Most everybody kind of knew where to start. They all kind of had that idea. They all kind of knew the, the trade to, to building something. There were some that obviously were better than others, but they used that analogy of, of a building and that Jesus is the cornerstone. Well, the cornerstone is the foundation. It's where everything else is measured off. If you don't have a cornerstone, if you don't have a point where everything else is measured off of, then your building is going to, you know, have walls that look like this. We lived in a house, 
um, it was my grandma's house, and we were living with her, taking care of her, and she lived about three or four blocks away from the paper mill. And those houses, my dad swore they never, they didn't know what a square was. Um, they didn't know what a level was. Because you could look at the building from the outside and look down the wall and you could shoot a line down the wall and it was just doing this number the whole way. I mean, there was nothing square about it at all. I mean, the hallway, you know, it, it looked like a horror film. You know, you walked down there and you thought something was going to jump out after you because everything was just crooked. And they just threw things together to, to make room for everybody that was working at the paper mill at the time and they provided those houses for them. But the idea was, you know, you've got to have a starting point. You've got to have something that everything else is measured off of. And we have Jesus to measure our lives off of. The perfect one, the perfect sacrifice. So there's no spots, there's no blemishes in Him. We know if we measure off of Him, if we build our, our everything, our lives, on the foundation of Jesus Christ, then we're going to come out all right. Because there's, there's no crookedness. There's, no, there, there's been no shortcuts taken. You know, you know that that foundation is sure and solid. And we are living stones. God has a place for us in His building. And He's, he's measuring us off of Jesus Christ. We're, we're a part of this temple that He's building. This, this spiritual building. And we're stones that's being placed in that. If you've been, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're a living stone. You're a living, breathing rock to give glory to God, to be used in His kingdom, His building that He's building. We are the body of Christ. We're a building fit together. And we're not only being built together and coming together combined under the uniqueness of, of being measured off of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ being our foundation, but our lives are also, personally, we're a temple. Our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. We're a temple. We're living stones. This is the place that the Holy Spirit resides in us if we're a saved, born-again child of God. And so He's at work growing us in our relationship to himself. So we're not only growing as a kingdom and as a, as a building, as a body of believers, as the body of Christ, but we're also growing in our faith and we're growing in our walk and our relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that's what we see here in, in 2 Timothy. Um, or, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. And um, then we talked about, you know, how he's, uh, how we are royal priests. We're part of a royal priesthood. We, we touched on this last week. That we are to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. This, this is what we're doing. You know, this is our purpose in life is to bring glory and honor to God. We're, we're a royal priesthood. I don't have to go to some person on earth, you know. Thank God that you people do not have to come to me to get forgiveness from God. That would, I would be a busy person. You know, if that's what I had to do all day, if, if I was mediating between you and God, your sins, that's, that's, that's a big job. That's, that's big shoes to fill. But He broke that down. See, in the Old Testament, they had to come and offer sacrifices. And there were chosen ones who were part of the priesthood that were able to offer these sacrifices and go into the Holy of Holies. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, and the veil was torn between the Holy of Holies, it gave us the right, because we are royal priesthood, we're, we're adopted sons and daughters into the priesthood of Jesus Christ that we can come into the Holy of Holies. The sacrifice has been made, completed, once and for all. The blood that needed to be spilled and shed has been done and dealt with. It was Jesus Christ. Now we're no longer sacrificing blood and animals. We're offering up spiritual sacrifices 
our bodies, our lives as worship to Jesus Christ because of all that He's done for us. So we're part of a royal priesthood, and we talked about that last week. So that kind of catches you up to date if you hadn't been here um, in a couple of weeks. But I'm excited about where we're headed this morning, but I want to read that passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-12, through 12, and we'll go from there. It says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Don't we find that so prevalent in today's world? having interesting conversations with different teachers and and different ones and those that are believers in Christ and those that aren't believers in Christ that are teaching our young people. Um, You know, we're, we're fed a lot of stuff. And we're feeding it to our children in our, in our schools that are things that are not true. Like, you know, I have to be cautious and, and tell Lexi because she's, man, she's gung ho. She's going to change the world. You know, she, she, and, and, you know, more power to her. I, you know, I pray that there's some young people that truly do stand up to, for what they believe in and what they know is true and stand up for their faith. But, you know, sometimes she can blurt things out, you know, and she's taking a stand, but you all, you have to take that stand. It's just like what we talked to the kids this morning, it's being courageous, but being courageous in love. You know, you can take a stand, but we don't want to be one of those that just hits people upside the head and, and tries to knock them down and say, you're such an idiot, I can't believe you believe this, but saying it and sharing it out of a life of love and making a stand and taking a stand and allowing your life to be the example, your life being a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's what we're to do, making that kind of stand for God and, and having conversations, you know, where, um, you know, I'll, I'll just go ahead and let you know I'm a young creationist as far as that goes. I believe that seven days is seven days according to Scripture. I don't, you know, I, I understand the argument of seven days, you know, a day is like a thousand years and this and what have you where it says that in Scriptures down the road, but I'm a young creationist. I believe that God spoke it, His Word spoken when, when God speaks something, there has to be a response. And it's going to be whatever He spoke. There's no choice. When He said, let there be light, then boom, there was light. It wasn't waiting around and letting Him architect it and build it and everything else for a thousand years. God can speak something just like He can speak something into existence in our lives where He can speak into us and say, live! Live! And you live because you have to live because God's Word spoke it to your life. Live. But in my daughter's conversations and some of the things that she says and some of the arguments that she brings up, you know, and talking about evolution because most of our, most of our school books, most of our, you know, all of our stuff in our school um, is teaching the evolution. They don't teach the other side of it as if, you know, they don't really know because in reality they don't really know what's truth. And so my daughter's very defensive about that. And I, and I appreciate that. And she makes a stand for that. And the, the thing is, it's, it's just the reason people have a problem with it, the, people, the reason people want to believe evolution is because if they don't, 
They have to believe that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And he becomes exactly what it just said there. A cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey. See, he is the cornerstone. That doesn't change. But he's become a stumbling rock for them and a rock of offense. Because they're believing a lie. Because they're trying to rationalize things. Because they're trying to believe something that's not true. Because they don't want to be held responsible. They don't want to be held accountable for their sins. They know if they accept that this this world, this life, everything about it was, was created by an architect and He is God. And He had a Son named Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins and three days later He rose again so that we might have life, then they're held accountable for their sins. There's someone to answer to. Evolution, there's no one to answer to but myself. I am my God. I am my own God. But when you throw God in there, And you throw Jesus Christ as a cornerstone, then He becomes a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And that's the reason we're we're in the age that we're in and we live in the world that we do and and people try to rationalize things the way that they do. we got to understand where they're coming from. we got to understand that the reason they don't want to accept Jesus Christ is because they're afraid to be accountable. Weren't you there? I mean, some of us may have grew up in church and didn't believe all the hogwash about evolution. And we were hoping and praying that, you know, God wasn't going to come out and call our number. But we knew. We knew that we were going to be held accountable regardless of if we accepted Him or not. We knew that we were destined for hell. But there's those out there that They want to grab a hold of that. They want to be atheists. They want to do this. They want to believe that. And they want to grab a hold of all these other things because it's easier for them because then they're not held accountable for their actions, for who they are. They don't have to answer to nobody. I I want, you know, that's what's tough is you got to answer to Him. I've already read the rest of the book. I know what happens in Revelation. Every knee is going to bow. (laughs) There will be no atheists on that day. There will be no evolutionists on that day. Because every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So... You know, I mean, hey, they may not accept it down here, but sooner or later, come Judgment Day, they will accept it and they'll believe it. The objective of our lives, well, let me, let me, continue, let me continue reading the rest of the chapter here. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you were a chosen race, we talked about this, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ there. Um, The objective of our lives is to bring glory to God. Most of us will sit there and shake our heads and nod and agree and say, yes, I believe that my objective in life is to ultimately bring glory to God. That's what it's all about. 
what we need to understand and what we need to realize, and I want to go back to that verse It says in verse 9, it says, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. All that you've faced, all that you've gone through, all that God is at work doing through your life is to bring glory to Himself. Okay? That's what He's at work doing. That's what that Scripture is telling us. That you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We don't understand our circumstances. We don't understand our situations a lot of times. For the most part, we think that we go through things, we go through trials, we go through tribulations at times, and we really don't know why it is that we're going through them. A lot of times we blame God for what we're going through. But He's bringing us through these things so that we may go through them To bring Him glory so that we can proclaim His excellencies. That's the purpose. How wonderful, how amazing, how holy is God that He would allow me to go through this trial, this tribulation, and bring me out on the other side victorious. Because you know what? I may not know the outcome. I may not know the reasoning why it is that God's allowing me to go through this circumstance and this situation. Why would He allow me to do this? Why would He put this on me? Because somewhere down the road, you're going to meet up with somebody who's going through the same exact thing you are. And faced with the same thing that you are faced with. Or very similar. And you are going to be able to reach that person and tell them and explain to them and maybe even give them verses that God spoke and promises that God spoke through His Word and your time with Him and how He helped you and as you drew closer to Him, how He gave you strength to go through that tribulation, to go through that trial so that you could come out victorious. And you'll be able to be compassionate to that person and know what it is they're feeling. Know their hurt. Know their brokenness. Know their pain. And be able to relate to them. That's why God allows us to go through things. Because we need to be people who can relate to other people and what they're going through. I mean, if we're up here on some high pedestal and nobody can touch us and we've never gone through anything... And we're on our holier-than-thou attitude rant. Then who are we? How can we help these people? How can we be the hands and feet of Jesus? Even Jesus Himself was tempted just as we are. He went and faced the same situations, the same things that we're faced with every day that slap us in the face as soon as we get up out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning. He was faced with that, yet without sin. That's why He's the perfect sacrifice. That's why everything is lined up. He's the cornerstone. He's the foundation. Everything's measured off of Him. But we look at that, and one of the the parts in that, it says, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You were once dark. You were once in darkness. And He positioned you into marvelous light. We sing a song. Into marvelous light I'm running. Out of darkness, out of shame. You know, that's a, that's a great song. We, yeah, I've I seen it. We got, the, we got the one little bridge part that you lift your hands and spin around, you know. See the light that I have found. That's what this verse is talking about. You're proclaiming the excellencies of Him who brought you out of darkness into His marvelous light. When you get in contact with light, you're changed. We're a reflection of Him. We're supposed to allow that light to shine on us and reflect off of us to others. 
And here's the thing. Those of you may be sitting there and, and, and you may have came here today and, and thinking all of the things that you've done in your past, all of the reasons why you can't be saved or why God can't forgive you or all of the things that you've done in your past, even as a believer and thinking, why would God want me? Why would God use me? He wants to bring you out of darkness into His marvelous light, into contact with Him so that you can reflect Him. So that you can shine. But we sit there and we, we negotiate and we, we start reasoning with our own understanding, our own mindset and our own thoughts and we say, I can't be like that person. I can't be like them. I can't do that sort of thing. God, you know I'm not that kind of person. You're right! You're not that person. You're you. And you're made new in Jesus Christ. And He wants you to be the you that you're supposed to be. Not Jason Parker. Not Jason Helms. Not Daniel Albin. Not anybody else in this church. He wants to show you what it's like to go from darkness into His marvelous light. And to proclaim His excellencies in the way that He wants you to do it. And we can say... You know, we'll say, well, they don't, they just don't know what I've gone through. They don't know who I am. They don't know all of the things that I've done. <laughs> yeah, and you don't know half of the stuff that I've done. And that's why I get excited. It's because, <laughs> not because you don't know, but because I know the darkness that I was and what God did in my heart and in my life. You don't know the half of what I've done when I was a believer in Christ, when I was a Christian, and some of the hell I went through, and some of the hell I put my parents through. And God washed me clean. God spoke to me and said, I still want you. I still want to use you. But you're going to have to let go of some things. That's why I'm here today is because I want to proclaim the excellencies of Him who brought me out of darkness into light. And when you come in contact with that kind of light, as often as I have, and you've seen the miracles that God can do, and, and you, you experience the fact that God could use somebody like you that feels like a failure, that feels like there's no reason I should be up here on this stage. There's no reason whatsoever on this earth that God should use somebody like me with my past and all of the things that I've screwed up and messed up in my life. But God says, I want you. You are a living stone and I have made you and created you so that you can proclaim the excellencies of me who has brought you out of darkness into light. And that's what He's work doing. He's working in you through these trials, through these suffering times to show off. God likes to show off. He wants to show off what He can do and He expects you to be a reflection of Him, the cornerstone. I want to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9-12 through 12 again. And this is, this is the New Living Translation version and I, I like some of the verbiage that it put um, how it you know takes on the same meaning but it, it's kind of a throw it in your face kind of moment um, verse 9 of that same passage but you are not like that for you are a chosen people you are a, you are royal priests a holy nation God's very own possession as a result you can show others the goodness of God for He called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Here's where I want us to park for a few minutes in closing. Verses 10 on down. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you, as temporary residents and foreigners... To keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very soul. Be careful to live properly 
among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when He judges the world. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. We talked about this when we were talking about us being living stones. You're not just some useless rock on the side of the road anymore. God came along and spoke your name and called you into His family. And you accepted Him into your heart, into your life as Lord and Savior. And He gave you, who had no identity, an identity. I mean, for the most part, isn't that what we've what we felt like when we were out there wondering? Most of us that are believers in Christ can say... You know, that's what I felt like. I felt like just somebody wandering through the world, not knowing what my purpose in life was, not knowing what's going on. Some of you may be believers and, and still feel that way because you haven't, you haven't surrendered and submitted to what it is God's purpose and calling is for your life. You keep fighting it. You're not, you're not confident and you're not satisfied With where God's placed you in His building. And said, I've got a perfect place for you. You fit right here. And we fight it and say, well, it's a little tight, God. You know? Well, that's because maybe He needs to shave off some things that you're still holding on to so you can fit right where He wants you to. But you're not some rock. You're not someone who has no identity. You now have an identity. You're now God's people. That's cool. I once was nobody, and now I'm somebody, and I didn't do a thing about it. All I did was accept Jesus Christ into my heart to save me and to forgive me of my sins, and now He has adopted me as His own. And now I'm a part of God's people. We were just a bunch of useless rocks destined to be crushed by our sin, but God gave us an identity. We didn't understand what mercy was until we received it from Him. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. See, we didn't know what love was. We didn't know what mercy and grace was until He called our name. And when He spoke our name and said, I want you. I love you. I'm calling you into my family. Then we experienced and knew what mercy was. It says in verse 11, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners... To keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. We're strangers in this world. We're strangers in this life. Okay? And it's, you know, it's about time that we accept that and realize that. Because the things that this world has to offer cannot satisfy We're trying to we're trying to grasp and we're trying to grab a hold of things that are temporary. And those things are waging war against our very souls. They're distractions, they're idols, they're little gods that we've placed in our lives that we've put above God, our Creator. They're things that we like to do. Sometimes it's hobbies. It's easy for it's easy for me, and my wife can can shake her head and nod that it's super easy for me to get caught up in a hobby. And man, when I do something, I go all or nothing. I mean, that's just that's just the way I am. That's the way I'm programmed. 
That's the way I do it. It's either all or nothing. I mean, when I played softball, it was all or nothing. When I played football, it was all or nothing. Baseball, anything I've ever done, golf, all of those things, paintball. I mean, hey, I can hunt and fish and paintball, golf, softball, baseball, football, you know. And where did I have time for my wife? I didn't because I had all these hobbies. And I had all these little gods. All these things that want to temporarily satisfy. But that's all they're going to do is temporarily satisfy. Nothing is going to satisfy us completely and fully until we're up there on our knees for all eternity worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Savior, Jesus Christ, who washed our sins away, who gave us life, And even then, it's not going to be enough time. I mean, to be able to be in the presence of a loving Father and a holy God for all eternity, praising Him, lifting up His name, because that's the thing. The reason you want to do all of those things, the reason we grasp at all of these temporary idols and all of these temporary things and we go all in on these things, is because we're looking to give ourselves completely over to something. We want to do it, and we want to do it big, and we want to do it all. Because we were made to worship. You and I were made to worship. And we end up worshiping the wrong thing. Because we grab a hold of these things. And we're temporary. We're we're strangers in this world. We're foreigners. We're temporary residents. So we must keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. It says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior. And they will give honor uh, to God when He judges the world. The reflection of the cornerstone is to be shown to our neighbors through our actions, our attitudes, our love to them, our service to them. I mean, if we want to truly worship God, and that's what we're created to do here on this planet, then maybe we should look out and have a keen eye and an eye that's fixed on Jesus and what He was, what he was interested in and what He was Uh, trying to locate around the world, and that's those that are hurting, those that are in need, and being of service to them. Like, you know, our neighbors that, you know, may be old and can't mow their grass, you know, giving them an extra hand and saying, hey, could I mow your grass for you? I know know you're down, and, and, you know, I I really hate seeing you out there trying to do it yourself. Can can I mow your grass for you? You know, can, can I jump in and do this? And sharing the love of Christ and showing the love of Christ by our actions and our attitudes that's what we're to be as living stones part of God's building we're to be a reflection of him and what is it that he did when he walked this planet he was busy about helping and serving others healing the sick caring for those caring for one another I can't tell you how critical and how important it is for us to stay connected as a church, as we grow, it's going to be harder and harder and more difficult and more difficult to stay connected. But if we start now, hopefully and prayerfully and through much prayer, Satan can't tear that bond apart. And we can continue to see what, the, what we have to be careful of. There are several things that we need to be careful of as a body of believers, as a church that's growing for God. Okay? One is that we must stay connected. When someone is hurting, be aware that that person's hurting. And, and following up with that person. And reaching out to that person and saying, I care about you. That means getting in contact with people during the week. Calling people and letting them know, hey, I love you. I care for you. Is there anything I can do for you? And then not only that, but it's real easy to have that kind of connection And as you grow and as new people walk through those doors, 
you have a you have a tendency to clam up. You have a ten, a tendency to say, "Well, I'm not sure I want that person in our crowd in our little group," you know. And, and it's real easy to push other people off to the side, and that's where cliques begin, and that's where you know cliques happen in churches. You got this group over here, and you got this group over here because you know this group doesn't get along with that group, and that group don't get along with this group, and. And you have all these different groups in your church, and we're one body. (laughs) How can we work together separate? It's not going to happen. That's why most of our churches, that's why most of us are going through the motions on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, and we're not effective out there in the world because we're going through the motions because we're a bunch of separate people. And we're not the body of Christ. We're not united as the kingdom of God for one purpose, one goal, and that is to reach those who are lost without Him and being a reflection of Jesus Christ. So, do you know what it is to be called from darkness into His marvelous light? And as a believer, are you experiencing that? Are you proclaiming the excellencies of Him? who called you from darkness into His marvelous light? Are you being a reflection of the cornerstone, Jesus Christ? If not, then maybe it's time for us to do a heart check. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, there's no way you can reflect Him. First, He's got to be the foundation. First, He's got to be the cornerstone in your life. And today, I hope and pray, is the day of salvation for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for this day. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, this stuff does not depend on me. I'm thankful that this church is not built on me. Lord, this is about you. Lord, my heart is heavy for those that feel like they're far away from God and that there's no point. Lord, I pray that you would shake them, that you would disrupt and disturb their lives, that you would call them out of darkness into your marvelous light. You would speak to them And draw them by your Holy Spirit to receive salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, for those that have known you, that do know you, and Father, feel like their lives have just been useless, and they're weary, and they're worn out, and they feel like there's no way that you can use them, God, I pray that you would ignite a spark and a fire in their heart. Lord, they would go back to the place where you called them from darkness into your light. The peace that they knew then, Lord, is the peace that they can know now because you have told us that if we come to you and confess our sins, you're faithful to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us, Lord, to wash away what once was. And we don't have to live like the old person. We don't have to go to our old ways. So, Lord, I pray that you would do the work in us. Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for what you're about to do in our lives as a church and as individuals. In Jesus' name.